Hi folks, welcome to a shop update. Let's talk about some quality of life improvements that we've made here in our machine shop. Let's talk about some new equipment that just showed up. We'll talk about how we're about to kind of overhaul our whole order fulfillment and organization. And let's start talking about Johnny 5 progress. So a couple of years ago, we started building a Johnny 5 project. And if you were watching this, and you saw the, the literally thousands of parts and the size of this undertaking, uh, I wouldn't have criticized you if you said, there's no way they're gonna pull this off. And we almost failed. Uh, when COVID hit last year, it threw a curveball at us, but we're back. So earlier this year, we reached back out to the local high school uh, VEX Robotics Team Advisor, and we found an awesome intern, Samuel. He came on board in January. Uh, he wants to go into engineering, and he's now working here, focusing full full time as a part time job on building Johnny Five. And it's been a great experience for us. It's been a great experience for him, and I think it actually serves as a really good example. Uh, it came up in a recent conversation with a a friend and mentor to me, uh, Ryan Winter at Seneca Woodworking. He was asking about how do I find uh, people for his machine shop for his business. And one way you can go about it is putting out a hiring advertisement or recruiting type software. But I found uh, you get such a better result if you go through some sort of a pre-filter process. And for us, we've had really two good sources. One is the local two-year vocational machine shop program, uh, obviously good fit for machine shop. The other is the this local VEX robotics team. And what I love about it is if a student has already chosen to participate in a robotics program as an extracurricular, that tells you they're interested in electromechanical stuff or they're interested in fusion or how things work. And that's the thing we really want. So uh, for other entrepreneurs or shop owners out there, think about that as a tool, um, whether it's talking to the advisor or kids in the program uh, as a source to find interns or find employees. Uh, but like I said, Samuel's done a great job. And we had this conversation because he's been going through all these parts, we made a lot of them and then you know, you guys came through. We've crowdsourced so many parts uh, that Samuel has actually finished both of the arms. We've got both the track drives done. We've got the whole lower section done with the first half of the torso. Uh, the second half of the torso has yet to be done. And then there's a fair amount of work that will go into effectively his shoulder. You can see the main part of the shoulder right there. Uh, and some of the neck area, which then leads into the head. Um, the head is incredibly complicated. Um, but that's the thing about this project. There's really no end to Johnny Five. You know, we'll get him built and assembled and it'll certainly look awesome, but we're gonna continue tweaking him for forever. Uh, whether it's small details, small functionality, uh, uh, certainly as we move into the electromechanical side, I always thought it would be cool to take Johnny Five to a local school and let kids be inspired by putting on a telemetry suit and moving them arms around. I actually don't think that's that crazy, but we gotta focus on building the robot first. And that's one of the lessons that we've learned about a project like this is you gotta design it and manage it in a way that you get momentum behind it. Uh, if you spend weeks or months on a really small part that isn't rewarding, there's no win to it, uh, it can really just kind of wear you out and a project like this can wear you out, trust me. Um, but if you can make progress and you start seeing recognized motion in the head, uh, Samuel's been working on the eyelids right now, which are, are rarely uh, recognizable and, and a really cool part of Johnny Five. Um, that's great. And just like finishing the arms was a huge uh, step forward and a, and a good piece of progress. And the other thing I wanted to share was two of the parts that we had gotten in didn't fit together. Uh, when we had sent them out, one of them was a three millimeter shaft and one of, the other, one of the other parts had a three millimeter hole. Well, if they're both perfectly three millimeters, they don't fit together. But this is the kind of stuff that they don't really teach in a lot of the academic world these days, or maybe ever. Uh, it's a, kind of the difference between real life and school. And so Samuel said, how do I fix this? And we had this rich, like wonderful conversation saying, well, uh, what do you think? You know, we could use a lathe and we could turn down the shaft and we could use a drill press to open up the hole. We could use a reamer, we could use a boring bar. You could sand it out, you could just deburr it. How far out is it? Um, because it ends up there's probably 20 ways you could legitimately fix these two parts. And uh, that's what it's all about. You know, I'm happy because Samuel's learning. He, he's happy because he's learning. And this is all part of the recipe. And it's also part of how we're kind of getting to where we are building up our shop and our staff. So uh, Johnny Five is coming along and well. As we get more done, we will be sure to share it. As we've continued this shop overhaul process over the last year, uh, there's been a huge emphasis on how we do stuff, being smart about it, making quality parts. And one of the things I'm so glad that we added were a lot more gauges and easy QC stuff. So we have lots more hand tools at each machine. Uh, we've been purchasing a lot of these master style ring gauge, which act as a go gauge for certain critical features. 
We've purchased go and no-go thread gauges to check any tapped holes to make sure that they're always acceptable. And we found these on McMaster. Screenshot here. The great thing about these is they're actually really inexpensive. And it's a go no-go gauge with two different sized pins. You can spec the sizes you want on each side. They're laser engraved. Super handy to have. We added similar tools over here at the lathe a couple of hard gauges, and then also some female ring gauges, so no-go and go for threads. These are really cool. If a thread is cut correctly, it will go in the go gauge, but it will not go in the no gauge. If it goes in the no gauge, that means the thread was cut too deep. Now, we also have been using our 3D printer more and more, especially over here at the lathe. For our Modvice washers, um, they have a taper along the face, kind of an exaggerated ski slope like this. And so we printed this gauge, which just gives us a really quick visual reference to compare that chamfer. Now, the way that these are programmed and made, it's not a feature I'm particularly worried about. If that, say, tool were to fail, there'd be a catastrophic failure, and you would know. But nevertheless, we like the fact that the gauge gives us a visual confirmation of that. And the top part there serves as a go gauge to confirm the whole size. We also make these with 3.17 inches of stick out in the raw material. We normally use this blue ruler that you can adjust for each job in each part and it lives right here in its own 3D printed bin but for repeat jobs we 3D printed a gauge it has the distance written on it it has a clearance area there in case there's a center tip left on the material and the distance that you see right here is the 3.17 inches and we've got a 3D printed part just so you know exactly what it's for we also added 3D printed tool holder stuff specific socket sizes labeled that we use on this machine some capto holders for tools that we leave set up. The 3D printed organizers and the red shower bins are hot glued down to the top. Uh, pick up a cordless hot glue gun, not expensive, super handy to have around, and it's the perfect amount of commitment, meaning this stuff generally stays put, but if you want to take it off, it comes off fairly easily, and a straight blade will peel the glue off. And the last thing we printed was this little spiky thing that lets us put small parts here. It drains the coolant down, but keeps the parts here if you haven't gotten a chance to say QC them uh, or dry them off, or normally we would then move them into the egg crates right up here. That way, when they come off, they always come off in order. In the event there is an issue, we can rewind back through. New machines. We replaced our TM3 machine with this VF3 SSYT. So the TM3 was a 20 by 40 machine. Honestly, no problems with it. It was a great machine. We wanted that additional uh, 26 inches in Y. So that's why we went with the 3YT over the VF4. Uh, this machine is actually the identical travels to the VM3. Uh, it's 26 by 40, and it's been great. Uh, we've only had it up running about a month. Um, but the other machine that just came in a couple of days ago is this guy, DT2. So, you know, it's funny. We'd seen these quite a few times, but it wasn't until we did our Area 419 tour and John said that the same G-code program that they pulled off of a VF2 and moved it over to this machine was 20, 30% faster, like literally 48 minutes down to 32 minutes. And it's simple. These machines are incredibly fast on their rapid movements, on their machine movements, on the tool changes, and probably the most important, on the spindle ramp up and ramp down. We went with the DT2 because we already had some 30 taper tooling uh, left over from the days when we had a robo drill. And my understanding, or what I was always led to believe, is that this was always designed to be a 30 taper drill uh, mill tap machine. The only reason they have the DM in the 40 taper is for shops that only want to standardize around 40 taper, but 30 taper tooling ought to work fine for what we need it for here. Uh, the DM is, I think, like 10 grand more. Uh, so that's the trick. But for us, when we're making plates, like the teaser of our new Shape Oco fixture plates, we're drilling and tapping a lot of holes. So the spindle ramp up uh, and acceleration will be a huge help to cycle time on those. And speaking of that, we're going through some great growing pains, I think like a lot of businesses go through, which is how do we be smart about going from making parts on a machine to shipped products? And how do we do that as we grow? And so we've really overhauled this space. We've taken a lot of things out of here in the last week. And what we want to focus on is a natural flow. So everything should converge in to what we think is going to be a center line right here, where we'll have QC and quality control and packing for fixture plates, which are relatively large. And then we'll have other sub-assemblies and other products picked over there. They'll converge right here. The labels will get print. The final boxes will get print. And they'll go on a shipping table or cart right at the end. We also picked up a pallet jack that has a built-in digital scale. This thing is great obviously works as a normal pallet jack 
around the shop, or you can turn on the battery powered scale. And with really no effort, know exactly how much your pallet weighs when you're trying to create a bill of lading. I think this is much better for a shop our size than having to dedicate space to a fixed, uh, relatively large floor scale where you've got to move stuff over there just to weigh it and then move it somewhere else. So we're trying to put into place what I've read about so many times, which is the spaghetti map. You know, make sure you're not moving stuff back and forth. Be efficient with how product and people move throughout a shop. Um, and it's easy to talk about. And so it's actually pretty tricky to implement gracefully, especially when you're limited by the way you have space set up with inventory racks, with industrial racking, with machines and parts and so forth. So we'll keep everybody up to date on that, but uh, we've got some good ideas. We've been learning as we go, and we do still keep a lot of things on wheels that let us stay flexible and think about uh, the right design. And yeah, so as always folks, I hope you learned something. I hope this stuff is helpful. Otherwise, take care. See you soon.